I'm going to turn the mic over to Stanley. Thank you so much for being here this year, and uh, we're going to talk Are about the challenges yeah. of Rye. Um, yeah, actually, thank you, Peter. Bef before I do that, though, um, I think I think I can I can speak for everybody, all the presenters and everybody here, for just an appreciation of a, a phenomenal program, and um, thank you very much. My pleasure. My pleasure. Also, Gina, and I, I mean, I'll, I'll say that that over the years, you know, Peter alluded to our relationship, which, which really started out when when I um, got in touch with him uh, around my first book, Inside the Jewish Bakery, and I found him to be one of the most generous, supportive, mentoring people I have ever come across, and I just and and I owe you just you know a tremendous amount of gratitude. Thank you, Thank you for you that. So much. Um, Okay, uh, just just for starters, uh, how many how many folks in here, a show of hands, have worked with rye? Wow, how many have worked successfully with rye? <laughs> okay, that, not bad, not bad. You know about uh, small attrition. Um, rye is is one of those grains where you know finally now it's starting to to gain some traction here, and what I like to say is that. Um, it's an overnight success in America after 2,000 years as the mainstay grain in northern, central, and eastern Europe. Um, there's, uh, for some reason, and I, I will get into it, um, but for some reason, rye has sort of been, it's sort of been, has actually been an afterthought. Um, and, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, I think that part of the reason that, uh, that rye's time is coming is because we're dealing with, uh, with a search for new culinary experiences. We've become, in a lot of ways, over the last 10, 15, 20 years, um, much more aware. If I were, you know, if I wanted to look at it in, in psychological, pathological terms, I'd say much more fixated on food. Um, but we, it, it has become, I think, a, a much harder, uh, a much greater part, um, and much more prominent part of our culture. Uh, there is a, you know, a tremendous amount of, of, of mass media around food, um, food porn. It's a constant topic of conversation, uh, new restaurants, blogs, and, and so on and so forth. So it, uh, uh, it has been a, it become a, a stimulating kind of force, and people are, are looking for new experiences. Um, at the same time, there is also a, um, uh, a reaction against mass production and the commoditization of food. Uh, and to the point where people are much more interested in not only the quantity, but also the quality of what it is we're putting in our bodies. Uh, people are much more conscious, obviously, you know, the, uh, the, the, uh, the GMO issue, uh, the organics issue, the question of additives, the question of, uh, of preservatives. Um, there's a tremendous amount of, of urban mythology around, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the effects of, of additives and, and, and various kinds of disabilities. Um, you know, gluten, the whole, the whole gluten thing is a big question. For a while it was carbs, for a while it was, you know, it's all kinds of other things. Now it's caffeine again, and you know, who knows what it'll be in, in five years. Um, also, there's a growing interest in, in ancient, um, ancient and heirloom grains and novel grains. And again, this is a sort of a subset of, uh, of our growing awareness in, uh, growing awareness of and our interest in expanding our, our food horizons, both as a, as a cultural experience and also as a sensory experience. And I think primarily as well, especially in this age of social media and electronically enhanced communication, which has come at the expense of interpersonal communication, I think that food represents a social opportunity that a lot of times, you know, we're, is, is missing in other parts of our lives. You know, I, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be sitting around, going to a restaurant even, uh, or go, you know, or look around where, where kids hang out at, uh, at malls and so forth, and they all have their phones out and they're texting to each other, even if they're sitting five feet away, you know. Um, and yet, sitting down and sharing a meal, breaking bread, okay, uh, becomes, becomes a primary social experience, and it becomes a form of bonding. And th there's one more factor, I think, that, um, that I didn't include that, that occurred to me after I, I made the presentation and sent it over here, and that is our community, okay? Um, there has been a, a tremendous shift 
in who's baking our bread uh, over the generations. Years and years and years ago, when I was a kid and would, would go, I lived in Brooklyn, you know, and grew up after the Second World War. Um, and the neighborhood bakeries were typically run by families um, where, the, where the, the, um, the trade and the business was passed from parent to child, from generation to generation. And children often had very few choices in what it was they wanted to do. And so people baked because that was what they did. Now what I find is that a lot of the bakers that I deal with are people who bring a different level of awareness and a much higher level of engagement, a level of intellectual curiosity, a level of commitment to the craft and to expanding horizons. And so I think that, again, combined with all of these other factors, um, that we become, as bakers, the prime movers of a, of a much broader kind of social community and social awareness and, and, and raising of, uh, of those things. Okay, but rye also comes with baggage, rye in particular. You know, people talk about Emory, you can talk about Durham, you can talk about Comet, Spelt, and all of those other things, uh, quinoa, amaranth, and so on, the novel, and the ancient grains, and those are pretty much neutral. The problem is that rye is not neutral. Rye comes with a whole bunch of things that are, that are, that are holding it back, and the first is probably uh, a tremendously long history of, uh, uh, of lower, uh, of, of social inferiority, okay? Dark breads, historically, um, in Europe, were considered to be socially inferior. They were considered to be peasant breads. Um, and in fact, there is a very interesting um, uh, expression in French. It's, uh, it's from uh, Brittany, and the expression is uh, finir de manger son pain noir which translated means uh, you know, to be finished eating one's dark bread, one's black bread. And what it, what it actually means is to return to a life of comfort after a period of, uh, uh, of hardship. Uh, and so the pain noir is considered to be the, uh, the, the symbol of hardship. And, and this, is a, uh, this is a prejudice that has, that has carried over. Uh, the second thing is that, and this is among bakers, is that rye doughs are more demanding than wheat doughs. Okay, um, you know, the reality is that the chemistry is different. Uh, whether it's more demanding or not, I think, is a matter of mindset, but this is the perception. Um, the third thing is that in this country, when the, when the bakers, when the rye bakers came over from Europe, bringing with them this, this anti-black bread prejudice, among other things, um, what did they find? They found this incredible, this, this ocean of cheap, abundant wheat. And so all of a sudden it was, you know, it was um, uh, Dorothy opening the door and walking into a technicolor world that was, that, that was Kansas, actually. But, uh, um, but, you know, I mean, for instance, talking about, let's say, the Jewish bakers, right, who came over, you know, baking these, these, these heavy, high percentage rise, all of a sudden, you know, they discovered, wow, man, I can, I can buy wheat even more cheaply and more abundantly than I can buy. I have to struggle to find the rye. The wheat is everywhere. Okay, and so what I'll do is I will, I will scale down my breads from 80% rye to 20% rye. Okay, I'll put in a little, you know, I'll, I'll keep the sour going, but instead of the, instead of the black bread, I'll, you, you know, letting it darken naturally, I'll throw in some caramel color or I'll throw in some coffee or some cocoa and darken it. So people will have their, their dark breads and they'll have the rye flavor and we'll throw caraway in to cover it up. Um, and, and basically this is, you know, this is what happened. Um, and so rye gets pushed to the margins, again, by, by this, this enormous ocean of, of cheap, abundant wheat. And then finally, and this is, you know, this is very widespread, you know, people say, we'll taste caraway, and they'll say, I hate rye, okay? When they don't, really don't hate rye, what they hate is caraway, okay? I mean, caraway is very intrusive stuff. I have never met anybody who is neutral about it, you know? You can't, you can't oh, take it or leave it. No, 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 no. It's either I love this stuff or I hate this stuff. Okay, so this is the baggage that we have to deal with, and these are the challenges, okay? The challenges, as I see it, come in two areas. The first area is production, right? And it has to do with the fact that, that rye doughs are, are perceived as more difficult. Rye is sticky, Okay, why is it sticky? It's sticky because it, its chemistry is completely different 
from weed chemistry. Weed chemistry is based on gluten, all right? I, we all know that. What is gluten? Gluten is a polymer that is formed when two proteins in the presence of water polymerize, they, and they form these, these nice elastic sheets that all hang together, and so when you have a nice, well-kneaded dough, you can just pull it, and it'll leave the sides of the bowl, and everything is terrific. Rye, on the other hand, is based on starchy gels, okay? There is, even though there are gluten-forming proteins in rye, rye does not form gluten because it's the wrong kind, um, wrong circumstances, whatever it is, and I haven't gone into the chemistry of that, rye does not form gluten to any appreciable degree. Instead, what you get is this, this pasty, viscous, sticky, gummy mess that has, the, that has the quality of being able to hold baking gases. And that's what gives rye its structure, okay? So it's sticky. Um, that stickiness makes it unsuited or relatively unsuited to automated production. Okay, there are some kinds of breads that work in semi-automation. Um, for instance, there are, there are breads that have very, very stiff doughs. And so those, can, those will go through machinery. Um, but a lot of the doughs are very sticky. And once you get them out of the mixer, they work extremely well in spiral mixers, not quite so well in planetary mixers. But once you, once you get them out of the mixer, a lot of it is handwork. And in fact, what you'll see in a lot of European bakeries and bakeries that bake large quantities of rye is that they will have big vats of dough and a whole bunch of, of workers shaping the dough into loaves. Okay, structural instability, and this is huge. Um, I just talked about the fact that rye structure is based on these starchy gels. Um, now, one of the things that, that came up earlier, I forget which speaker, it was yesterday, uh, was we're talking about amylase enzymes, and it was, it was in, in connection with sprouty, sprouted grains and, uh, and other such things. And um, the problem with, with amylase enzymes, and rye is extremely rich in amylases, is that they break down you know, it was, I guess it was Nathan who first talked about how enzymes can cut bonds, okay? Well, what amylases do is they cut down, they cut the bonds between complex carbohydrates, i.e. starches, also called polysaccharides, okay? A polysaccharide means multi-sugars, and it'll cut the bonds, and it'll form simple sugars. Now, that's great for sweetening the dough, but the problem is that when you cut these polysaccharides, you're eliminating the starches that create the rye structure, okay? And so what happens is if you let a rye dough ferment too long and the enzymes continue to, to activate and to, and to cut these and to, and to break down the starches into sugars, that's when you end up with either a doorstop or half the loaf on your knife, okay? Um, now, the saving grace to that, and this is really cool, this, I, I love this, is that amylase activity is inhibited in the presence in acidic environments, which is why so many rye breads are based on, on sour starters, sourdough starters, and others, most of them, have other acidifying elements, whether they are yogurt, buttermilk, honey, um, uh, a couple of, have a couple of breads that are, that are acidified with, uh, uh, with apple cider, okay? But whatever it is, those acid environments create um, an, an inhibitory force that prevents or that slows the breakdown of the starchy gels. It's, it slows, it doesn't stop, which means that you have to pay more attention to your rye doughs. If you, if you over-ferment, uh, a wheat dough, yeah, you might, you, know, you might run into problems that Marcus talked about um, in terms of oxidation and so forth, but, or well, that's overmixing, excuse me. But again, I'm, I'm thinking now about um, when I bake bialis, okay, wheat bialis. We take those to full proof, okay, which means that if I touch, if I touch the roll after it's come to proof, it's at, it's at the point where it's just at the point of collapse, okay? Um, I can't do that. If I, let, if I let my rye breads overproof or overferment, then they're going to end up again as doorstops. Okay, the second set of challenges is the marketing challenge, and this is probably an even bigger one because we have to deal with all that baggage that I talked about earlier. Um, for one thing, rye products are not widely available. 
uh, and it's a chicken and egg question. Are they not widely available because of lack of supply, or are they not widely available because of lack of demand? Okay. Um, Marcus just talked about availability of, uh, of ingredients. All right. Do, are bakers not baking rye breads because they can't get the flour? Or are they not baking rye breads because nobody asks for them? Um, and here is the other, here's another problem, consumer unfamiliarity. Because again, we live in a, in a, in a highly wheat-centric environment um, where in the market, uh, people, people don't know about rye. And they, they, they really don't understand it. I'll, I'll tell a story. When I first signed the contract uh, for the rye baker with, uh, with my publisher, Norton, um, my editor suggested that I bake uh, a loaf of a different loaf of bread every week and send it to their editorial meetings, which were held on Wednesday morning, and there were all of the senior editorial staff and all of the senior corporate management staff. And this is a, a very sophisticated, educated, well-traveled group uh, in New York, right? Fine. So you know, I started baking, started baking, started baking. And I'm sending the thing in, and a couple of weeks in, I I, I call Maria and I, I say, well, how was the you know how'd they like it? And she said, well, they went absolutely apeshit. She said, you know, they just said, this is rye bread. I've never had anything like this. And this is just, you know, and this is like the top end of the market, right? These are the sophisticates. These are the people who have been around. And they had no idea, absolutely no idea. Um, and so if that is true of that demographic, then let's take it down one or two or three layers into, into broader levels of society that maybe aren't quite so sophisticated or quite so well-traveled. You know, and maybe the only thing they know is the rye that they get at the local coffee shop when they order, you know, like a tuna on rye or if they're, you know, a salami on rye or whatever, which is, again, 10% rye, 90% wheat, and 50% caraway. <laughs> you know? Okay, and here again, we run into the rye caraway prejudice. And so these are the challenges that we have to deal with, all right? Let's talk about overcoming these production challenges. All right, the key takeaway, rye is not wheat. All right, a lot of bakers, you know, I've, I've taught workshops all over the place, and a lot of bakers, the big problem with, with this perception of rye as a difficult grain is that a lot of us, and this, this is true of me when I first started, a lot of us start baking rye and expect it to behave like wheat. You know, and we go, oh, this is, oh, yeah, this is terrible. I can't deal with this stuff, you know, because I'm, I'm just used to all this nice, you know, this, this nice, neat, non-sticky, elastic stuff, right? Rye is not wheat, okay? Again, it's the different chemistry, the starch versus gluten. Um, the characteristics of the doughs are different, okay, in the sense that, again, there is no such thing. It is impossible to window pane a high percentage rye dough. It is impossible to stretch and fold a high percentage rye dough. It doesn't happen. What happens is you try to stretch it and fold it, and you end up with two handfuls of dough and a very large pile in the middle, all right? <laughs> all right, on the other hand, there are advantages. Because rye doesn't require time for the gluten to form, uh, it, it, it's a shorter mixing time. Generally, I only mix my doughs for two, three, four minutes until the doughs are well hydrated. And that's the end of it. I just pull them out and, and start my bulk fermentation. Okay? Um, but again, I talked about the susceptibility to starch attack, which is this, this, uh, this amylase um, activity that, uh, that degrades the starchy gels and, and uh, erodes the structure. Um, and again, it's a mistake to expect wheat behavior from rye. So what you have to do is understand and respect rye's unique qualities. And it's, it's really, it's too bad that Nathan had to leave tomorrow because right now I'm going to call him out. Um, oh, he had to leave yesterday, sorry. Because um, I'm going to call him out. I don't know how many of you have looked at the book, but, you know, in fairness, I contributed to the book and I, I peer-reviewed the, the chapter on rye and, and so forth. And then when I got it, I looked at the rye recipes and I was really, really shocked because every single one of his recipes in, for rye calls for the addition of vital wheat gluten. Okay, and what that says to me is that, you know, this is this attempt at weedification of rye, okay? You expect, you know, we're expecting, he wants rye to act like wheat, and so what he does is he takes the key structural element 
you know, and does like a gene transplant, okay? Um, and so I, I suppose we could call it, you know, genetically modified bread. I don't know, but, uh, um, but, but that, and again, I, you know, it's, it, which is not to say that, that his approach um, is illegitimate. He, he and, and the modernist, the modernist bread, bread approach, I, in my view, um, is a technocratic approach that puts product over process. I, I am enough of a, of a curmudgeon to think that process matters and that you, know, that you have to learn to, you know, to, to paint with oils before you can go onto a, a computer and, and start making art that way. Um, OK, how do we overcome these challenges? Again, change of mindset and expectations. Learn to love sticky. Okay, learn to deal with it. Um, I have at this point, I really have no problem handling rye. All right, you know, it comes out of the mixer. So what do I do? I, I wet my utensils. Okay, that eliminates the problem of sticking. All right, I either work it on a well-floured work surface or with a spray bottle, so that it doesn't stick to the work surface. Okay, the shaping is incredibly easy. Do you remember yesterday that video of, uh, of La Farm Bakery and the extent to which that, that wheat dough was handled with, you know, if you're stretching and folding, you know, that's, that's one, one cycle of handling. And then the pre-shaping, the dividing and the pre-shaping, that's a second level. The third is the shaping. And then if you're, if you're baking baguettes or, or something like that, moving it from the couche onto the peel and the peel into the oven. Rye requires only, basically only two, two steps if you're, if you're going to be handling it. And the first step is the, is the bulk fermentation. Uh, the second step is either putting it into one of three forms, a freestanding loaf, a pan loaf, or a proofing basket. And that's it. There is nothing, nobody, nobody or very few breads um, require extensive handling or extensive shaping. Okay, so it's either a boule, a baguette, if you're doing free, uh, I'm sorry, a boule or a batard if you're doing freestanding, uh, an oval loaf, um, or again, into a pan or into a proofing basket that you're then going to flip over onto the peel. The third thing is because rye, most rye breads are, are sourdough based and often they require two or three stages of fermentation, you need to rethink your production time frames and production cycles. Okay, which means that, again, and, and Marcus talked about this also in terms of using uh, uh, natural starters, that you may have to, you may have to spend uh, a couple of days where as a, a normal, I, it takes me, if I'm making sourdough baguettes, it may take me um, eight to 10 hours after I make my overnight, my overnight fermentation of my sponge. It may take eight to 10 hours after that to produce it. A rye bread, often may take 18 to 24 hours start to finish, but it may only require 15, 20, 30 minutes of, hand, of actual handling time, okay? And so one needs to think, if you want to get involved in the production of, of rye breads, you need to rethink your production cycles, all right? They take longer. But the other thing is that because rye breads, because of rye breads' structural chemistry, um, they don't go stale nearly as quickly. Marcus just talked about the fact of his, of his breads having a shelf life of, of one to two days. A typical high percentage rye bread will have a shelf life of six to 10 days, okay? And a lot of them really aren't even edible uh, until 24 to 36 hours after coming out of the oven because it takes time for the, the starches to stabilize and for, the, and for the moisture to redistribute through the loaf, okay? Um, are there any questions about the about production? And I can I can talk some more about that. I'll pass the mic over. Then I got to run quick one while you're while I'm getting the okay. mic out. Um, when you were talking about longer uh, uh, rising time fermentation, yes. are you referring to a dough made exclusively with starter or a combination of starter and yeast? Um, well, it, 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 this this again, this is not a simple question because. The Germans, in their, you know, in, are, are amazing when it, when it comes to classification of stuff. They classify starters and pre-ferments into, into four different categories. Um, the first category, which they call type zero, is just a basic yeast and, and flour water starter, typically a, a poolish. Um, but then you get into the, the, uh, the two sour starters, type one and type two. Uh, a type one starter is a leavening starter. 
okay? And that typically will, will mature over eight to 12 hours. Uh, the second type, and that normally, if you're, if you're pre-fermenting, um, a minimum of around 35% of your total flour, you don't need additional leavening, okay? The second type of, of starter, the type three, the second type of sour starter, um, is, a, is an acidification starter, and that typically matures over 18 hours to three or four days, and that often will require the, the addition of, uh, of commercial yeast to, to spike the dough. So it varies. It, it yeah, depends. it depends. Yeah, it depends on, on the maturing but time. Even with commercial yeast, you still have a, a longer uh, fermentation, a rising time, or um, again, I, again, it really, it really depends because it's going to depend on the hydration of the dough. Um, lower hydration doughs take longer take longer to uh, to ferment. Um, but looser doughs will you know will, will just blow up. Okay. So, um, but the other thing is, it's really important to pay attention to the fermentation and to the dough because again, what you're dealing with is you know you want it, you want fermentation activity to peak without the uh, the the amylase activity starting to erode the structure. Okay, and so what, what you have to look for in, in the bulk fermentation is as soon as that dough, the upper surface of the dough, starts showing broken bubbles or cracks, it is ready, okay? Which means that you have to keep an eye on it. It demands much more attention than, than wheat dough. Thank you. That was my question, is, is what does bo fully f uh, fermented bulk fermentation look like in a rye dough? Yeah. So what? Yeah. Again, what it looks like is you're going to see massive expansion in most cases, except for very stiff doughs, and you're going to see either either very small cracks, um, or you're going to start to see like pinpoint broken bubbles. This, by the way, on the margin is uh, is is one of my starters. Uh, that's a you know that's a that's a mature sponge. Um, if you if your if your uh, bulk fermentation looks like that, you're you're in trouble. That, okay. So. So you're looking just for the little cracks. Looking for yeah, for you know really small cracks, uh, or or very small like little pinhole bubbles. Thank you. Um, can we convert our existing wheat sourdough starter into the rye sourdough starter, or do we have to start it from scratch with only the rye? I'm sorry, say it again. Um, sorry. Can uh, we uh, yeah, can we convert our existing wheat sourdough starter into the rye sourdough starter by mixing the two? Probably, I don't know. Um, well, my my feeling about about starters generally is that um, they really don't care what they eat. <laughs> you know, nice. um, I mean, they'll eat you know they'll eat wheat, they'll eat rye, they'll eat vegetables. You know, ask anybody who does who does any kind of fermentation, they don't care what they eat. It's easy. So. Um, and I mean, simply what's important is you've got a population of microorganisms and you just want to keep them, you know, fed and happy and fruitful and multiplying and all that other stuff. So, mm -hmm. so whether you feed them with wheat or rye, which is why I keep, I keep one starter, okay? And when I want to bake I, and I feed it with rye, when I want to bake with wheat, I use my rye starter because, you know, worst case scenario, it may come out to, you know, to one half of 1% of, of total flour. Um, which is not going to make a whole lot of difference. Yes. How did um, rye bread get so synonymous with caraway seeds? Because that's how I started baking mm. rye bread. Was well, because I couldn't stand the caraway seeds. Ah. Uh, how does um, it? How did it become? Well, that's. Uh, synonymous. That was the question. Yeah. Synonymous with caraway. How yeah. How did rye become so, much so, caraway? so synonymous even with if caraway? You buy a loaf of, I mean, I grew up eating rye bread. Yeah. In Philadelphia. Right. And I don't ever remember the caraway being so prev prevel prevalent, pervasive. as pervasive as it is now. Because even if you buy a loaf of seedless rye in the grocery store, yeah. it's still got some caraway in it somehow. Yeah. Well, I think I think part of it is you know is sort of compensatory for the uh, for the diminishing percentage of rye. Back when I was a kid, the Jewish bakeries, a typical typical loaf of rye bread contained 35 to 40 percent rye. Okay. Now, what passes for rye bread commercially? Um, is typically somewhere in the 10 to 15, 20 percent range. Um, in fact, in Germany, which again has very strict, very strict classification rules for breads, rye bread can only Roggenbrot is only applicable to breads containing 90 percent more or rye. Um, anything from 50 percent rye up to 90 is called Roggenmischbrot, mixed rye bread. Uh, anything from 49 percent to to 10% rye is called Weizenmischbrot, mixed wheat bread, and anything that contains 90% wheat or more is, is, is entitled to be called Weizenbrot. 
Um, and so really, if we were to use German classifications, what, you know, what is sold as, as rye bread here is really almost pure wheat bread by German classification. Okay? As far as, as, far as the, the caraway is concerned, again, I think that, um, and again, I, you know, it, to me it seems to be a marketing thing. Um, you know, somebody, somebody says, oh yeah, well, you know, people, people expect uh, caraway in rye, and so let's, let's increase the caraway, and that's it. Um, when I was a kid, you could still get unseeded rye bread. You know, so. Okay, let's move on to the marketing challenges. Oh, oh you've got more to cover, I'm sorry. Oh, oh I'm sorry. To cover. I'll, I'll, I'll talk fast. I just, okay. I'll talk like you know, like one of those pharmaceutical commercials. <laughs> okay. The, the the million dollar question is how do we induce trial? Okay. That ultimately that's what it's about because if you get people to taste it, either they're going to like it or not like it. Hopefully they're going to like it. But how do we get that piece of bread into their mouth in the first place? Um, address consumer needs. Okay. And I like to use the the acronym AN. Okay. A represents authenticity. Okay? People are looking for authentic food experiences. They're looking for a connection with time and place. Okay? They're looking for, um, this is real food. Okay? This is something with history. This is something that takes me back. This is a connection to my own past. This is an ability to vicariously experience someone else's past as part of a cultural experience. First end is novelty. Okay, rye breads are flavorful. And they're unlike anything you've tasted before if you want to forget this whole caraway association. Okay, and people are looking for novelty. They're looking for new flavors, new stimulations, new experiences. The second N stands for nutrition. Okay, and rye is just, is, beats out wheat in almost every, in almost every dimension. Uh, higher in fiber, higher in protein, um, higher in trace elements. Um, uh, lower glycemic index and much lower in calories. Uh, one ounce of 100% uh, of, of rye bread contains less than 70 calories. An ounce of, um, uh, of, of a typical wheat bread contains 80 to 85 calories. So you can have your bread and eat it too, all right? Okay, how do we induce trial? Major objection, I hate caraway. And how do we overcome it? Sampling, okay? Just keep some bread on the counter. Don't tell them what it is. Just say, here, you know, taste this, taste this, taste this. Second thing, on the shelf, don't tell them it's rye bread. <laughs> instead, instead, use some of the other names, right? Berliner Landbrot, Danish Pumpernickel, Burudinsky, okay? Amelander, you know, on and on and on. Nor Normandy cider bread. Uh, you know, I mean, there's a whole bunch of them. And all of these names conjure up an exotic experience, okay? And so, you know, and then afterwards you can say, hey, you know what it was you were eating? All right. You were eating rye bread. Oh, okay. <laughs> and if your bakery has a cafe, smota bread, okay? Last year, um, one of the speakers here, a guy from uh, Panera, Right, was talking about, talking about really interesting, really interesting uh, uh, survey results that they had taken. They were asking their customers, um, do you eat bread? And, or just a, a sample of consumers, and they said, no, I, we try to avoid bread. Well, do you eat sandwiches? Yes. Do you eat pizza? Yes. Do you eat hamburgers? Yes. Um, and so what this tells me is that bread is often perceived as a substrate or as a container. Okay. And smurbrads, these open-faced sandwiches, offer a tremendous opportunity both to, you know, to get people to eat the bread without really thinking about the fact that they're eating bread. And also, it provides an opportunity to introduce them to some really interesting pairings and to some visually beautiful food. Um, one of the things, again, that I, you know, that uh, one of the lessons I learned in working with my publishers was that people eat with their eyes. Okay, and so, which is why um, the, the photography in the rye baker cost an unconscionable amount of money. <laughs> so, but I mean, but these things are gorgeous, you know? Um, and it's the kind of thing where if you've got a cafe and you can, you know, offer 
a wide range of these things. I remember, you know, I, I've been in Copenhagen and gone into these restaurants and they just have these cases of gorgeous, gorgeous food. And it's, you know, like, well, I can only eat three, but I'll buy eight. You know, they just look so good. Um, and so that's the story. And so in conclusion, I think rye bread represents a huge untapped business opportunity if we can solve both the production and marketing challenges. The second thing is that the production challenges, in my view, appear a lot greater than they are. Marketing challenges call for creative but easily implementable solutions. Okay, simply have to think outside the box a little bit and say, okay, how am I gonna go around all of these prejudices and preconceptions and get people to stick that piece of bread in their mouth? Bake it and they will come. <laughs> thank, you. Uh, thank you so much, Stan. Um, well, we're going to wrap things up, but we'll leave some time for Q&A. I want to leave a little time for just some final comments from the audience, a little discussion stuff. But before I do, allow me to present you oh, thank with you. your knife. Thank from you very much. J.A. Hinkles. Um, yes. <laughs> and, 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 and of course, uh, because you're doing your rye bread correctly, it will yes. not leave a lot of dough on Right. The, exactly. On no, this is guaranteed not to stick. Not to stick. <laughs> My, my trick for, uh, I think, in the Smart Broads to show this yeah. is, uh, is cooked whole rye berries and add them to the dough. Yeah. The textures of the whole, cooked berries, whether wheat, rye, whatever. Uh, we, we had some cooked wheat berries for lunch today. I, mean, some, I think that's a hot item right now. People are loving yes. the texture of whole cooked grains. Yes. But thank you for oh, uh, kind of illuminating, illuminating this subject for us. But what I'd like to do is just throw open to the crowd the, an opportunity for any, any sort of takeaway comments. Okay, you can go back to seat. Uh, any takeaway comments that you might have about maybe things that you'll that that can you can carry beyond the symposium or any other comments that you want to make? But especially last year, we kind of put the word out there. What are some of the things that you felt uh, are, were useful to you that could be things that you can take with you and present to people who were not here? So if anybody would like to sort of chime in with your own thoughts or comments, we'll just do it for five minutes or so, and then I think we'll call it a day. Pardon me. Questions for Stan, that's, that's fine too. Who has a question for Stan? I, I had a question on uh, where do you, Stan, where would you typically find the, uh, the German rye flowers here in, uh, here in the US, like the Roggenschrot or the T997 uh, and so on? Where would you find these here? I use, uh, I use domestic rye flowers, first of all, and um, most of the, there are, the Germans generally uh, divide, their, divide their flowers into five different categories based on the ash content. You probably know that. Um, white rye flour, domestic white rye flour, and most of the rye flour I get is from either uh, Bay State Milling, uh, which does virtually all, um, which does virtually all of the large scale rye milling in the country. They, they, they contract for general mills and for, and for um, um, ardent mills and so forth. Um, and, uh, and I also I get rye from, from central milling. Um, white rye is the equivalent of German 812. Uh, that's US, that, and that's marketed in the US as white rye. Um, 997, which isn't used all that much in Europe, um, is, not, is not available in any form in the US. And so normally when I, when I need 997, um, I will blend um, either a medium rye flour or um, uh, or Central Milling's uh, pale light rye flour, which is the equivalent of 1150. Um, incidentally, the, the, German, the German rye classification system, as I said, is based on, is based on ash content, um, and, the, uh, and the numbers typically refer to um, uh, one hundredths of a percent. So, um, so type uh, 997, for instance, is around one percent ash. Um, type um, Type 1130 is about 1.15, 1 1.13, 1.15%. 1 1 um, type 1370, which is the equivalent of US medium rye, is about 1.35%. 1, 1 and then whole rye is the equivalent of 1740, um, which is, uh, which would be, which again would be a whole rye. The problem, and I have a blog entry on this, the problem in, in, in the US is that a lot of different millers um, there's no consistency in, in the naming of, of rye flowers. So for instance, um, Bob's Red Mill organic dark rye flour is actually whole rye. 
Okay, whereas Bay State's dark rye flour is the equivalent of Austrian type 2500, which is, the, which is what's left over after the lighter grades have been sifted out. Um, so it becomes problematic. But to answer your question directly, um, if, you know, if you know what the ash percentages are, you can simply, you know, you can simply um, solve for the, for the end value and then blend. And that's typically what I do. And did you say that, uh, and you're, you have a blog entry that kind of reiterates? Yes. The, yeah. Now, how do yeah, they get to the blog entry? The ryebaker.com. Ryebaker.com. And is and any of this stuff also in the book, in the, the Rybaker uh, book? No, actually, is it? Yeah, I think it might be. Okay. Uh, but it's called the ryebaker.com. Get, get to that blog for sure. That That's useful because there's so many numbers, it's hard to. By the way, uh, Jennifer, are you also uh, milling rye right now? Am, yeah, we, we mill the Renz Abruzzi as we um, all got to taste yesterday with Lionel's bread. Uh, and the picture of Billy Carter, but, um, and I don't know if you can answer this or not, but yes, rye is different than wheat genetically, and it becomes really clear too for me when milling. Um, if I'm milling a soft wheat, I would think, you know, when you're stone milling, I mean, part of, <laughs> part of the reason why roller mills took off is, you know, hard wheat is harder, and, and, the, and the brand tends to crash and go through the screens, but with soft wheat, it will flake, and you can get a cleaner sifting. Well, with rye, it is a softer grain, yes. but it's the one grain that really gives me challenge when I'm trying to sift. Mm -hmm. um, it's like I can do a more si like I can have my sa the same screen for a high extraction flour and get and get the siftings of a, a lower extraction. And even if I put the screen on for a lower extraction, I'll get the same. And I'm I. It, I'm going to work with it tomorrow, but I, d I want to find a resource for learning more about that because I it, it's been different with different years, but right now I'm challenged by it. Yeah, I think I think probably the person to talk to might be Glenn, um, Glenn Roberts. Um, but I think I think that um, part of you know part of the problem is is you know the rye endosperm um, fragments much more quickly, and it has a tendency to clump. You know, I, I almost think it's like powderier. The endosperm yeah. is, is finer to begin with. Like my yep. theories of it's lighter. We know rye is 20% more volume. Uh -huh. So if I have any wind going through through the mill, is it is it picking it up and taking it? Because with, with the endosperm of wheat, it's heavy. It's the heavies right. that drop first. Right. And with rye, it's almost as if, I mean, I think it's lighter or something. I don't mm -hmm. well, <laughs> it's yeah, the it moments is. of what am I doing, you know? Well, it is. I mean, let's, well, let's think about the roller milling process because what happens is after it goes through the rollers, uh, it goes into blowers, okay, and the blowers separate the particles by weight, and then you know, and then they go into the various, into the various hoppers. Um, if you're, you know, if you're stone milling, then you know, then you don't have that, and the and and it seems to me that the that the endosperm particles will tend to hang around uh, a lot more. So, and again, they don't have the weight because they're so light, so they don't have the weight. They'll get stuck in the uh, in the mesh. Will, will will he be able to see the mill next week at at the festival? So you'll be able to actually look at her situation, and maybe give her some real direct comments on that. But it does, it does just one other quick point. It, to me, part of the struggle is without the immediate ability to get my ash content, is understanding. You know, I would I would feel so much better if we did have a designation in this country because I I don't exact. You know, I mean, I'll go home and test it for myself, but in terms of, you know, it's it's somewhere that I wish we only sold whole rye flour because we used to only do that and we started playing around with sifting and it's yeah. like. Mm -hmm. so this is definitely one of the challenges of yeah. rye in this country in, is that we need those standards for sure. Uh, uh, Paul has a question for you, Jen. Yeah. <clears throat> Jennifer, have you tried um, remilling the your, your preliminary sift? We we don't remill, we do single pass and um, it, it for more than one reason, but it just doesn't, it doesn't work for us, and I, I feel really good about a single pass, too. Yeah, well, I, I, well I'll agree with that, but um, depending on your mill, what you may be doing, what, what, what I've observed with um, just small-scale milling, and in particular, um, I could show you the difference uh, right here with, uh, later with, uh, uh, with some rye that I have here, but um, is that you get a kind of a shaving effect with some mills, and, you, and so that the, if you look at the bran, it's, it's really almost like shavings, almost in some way like wood shavings. And, if, and, and so if you repass that, um, if that's what you're getting, and that that's what you know, uh, rings a bell, 
I've, I've noticed that when I repass that, then I get a very satisfactory uh, uh, sifting of that, of that repassage. I mean, we do, sorry, if this is appropriate, we do crack rye and crack wheat for a brewery that we run over big screens. And I found that the, the siftings from that will run it over a finer screen. And I started doing, and it's a very high ash content. I can tell it's really high in minerals and dark. And, it, and with the wheat, it, it, it run over another screen. It, it is the perfect application as a graham cracker. I tried a bunch of different. Here you go. I mean, it makes the best. And I haven't tested the rye yet, but I will say it, it's not, I mean, this is the realm of wanting a milling scientist in the room because it's not the same thing. It's not the same thing, y and I have I have seen, you know, I mean, there is a bunch of information out there about this somewhere that I haven't found yet, but I know there's been, because it just isn't the same thing to run something in twice or to get, like, if I crack the rye, run it over the screens, and then remill that other thing, I'm not going to get the same flowers if I put all the rye in and run it over certain screens. It's it's not the same product. So that's it's not the same product in, in more milling, than one. Yeah. Yeah. So so at, for the sake of time, I, I that's okay because that's that that's what this is about. Is we're talking about those deeper levels, but um, we're coming to the end. So let let's get some final comments. Uh, and I've got, why don't we pass the mic? You go first, and and then okay. we'll and we'll, do, we'll wrap things up. Go ahead. Um, I just want to say that I think you had a nice mix of both amateur and professional stuff going on here. And I was um, very intrigued with Aaron's uh, science project. And I've got a bunch of friends who have grandchildren, and I'm certainly going to pass that yeah. her links on to them. Yeah, the citizen science concept and aspect is such a brand new thing. Let's go. Why don't you pass that mic on up to Tommy? Um, and while he's doing that, uh, I, I just wanted to uh, just make one presentation, and that is uh, all, most of you have met Gina throughout the, the course of the symposium. She has been uh, at my right hand throughout the last two months of putting this all together. And so you too get a knife, Gina, for, for thanks. And, <laughs> and, 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 and uh, I, I think you'll, you'll all agree, because and, and, you have no idea all the things that she and Allegra and the rest of our team have been doing behind the scenes so just to allow me to be able to be out here with you. And so I couldn't have done this without Gina, and thank you very much. Yeah. All right, we've got more comments. Tom. Yes. Uh, yeah, my, my biggest takeaway and kind of where, where I feel now is, number one, how do, we, how do we drive this paradigm shift to where we get the consumer to respect the grain and really respect what's going on there and get it to the level of a single source origin coffee to where you're willing to pay a 700% a premium on that. So how do we connect? But then also at the same time, how do we get a paradigm shift in, in that capturing that passion that happens at an artisan level with my generation and the next and really looking at, you know, how do we respect the past but then pass the baton and move forward as, a, as an industry and really getting people excited about that and into the culinary schools because like you had ex expressed, you know, it's a small percentage that want to get into this realm and it's something that's so fundamental to the human experience in a, in a broad cultural perspective and that's kind of, I guess, the bigger, the bigger concept of where I've left and you know, it's an amazing to see the, the wide range of speakers that have come together and just the, the variety of the topics and how they're all disparate and separate, but they all come together and, and kind of pull together. So great job on that part. And yeah, thank you. But you're right. An, an event like this begs the question, how do you, wh where, where do you go from here? How do you, how do you extend these two drops of water in the ocean to turn it into, you know, a pond in the ocean? And that's a challenge. I don't know that there's an easy answer. If anybody has any comments or thoughts about that, please feel free to, to add it. Uh, yeah, again, I think, I think the issue really is about, um, it's about branding, and it's about getting people to, to get that piece of bread into their mouths. I think from the branding aspect, um, the population at large, and, and I guess it was, uh, I think it was Nathan who raised the issue yesterday, um, why don't people pay for bread in a restaurant? Okay, and that's because bread, again, is largely viewed as a commodity, and it's viewed as an adjunct. Okay, and what I think we need to do is to reposition it as a specialty food product in the same way that we may position, um, you know, I, I think, you know, we can, use, we can use wine, okay, of a particular vintage, uh, or we can use um, Spanish ham, right, as an example. Um, but to create a, a mystique around it and, and a unique identity that makes people want to pay for it, that makes people want to experience something that is out of their realm of experience. Bread, 
Bread is bread. Okay? I'm gonna go into the I'm gonna go into the, the restaurant and there's gonna be a basket of bread. Okay? It might be very good bread, it might be dark bread, it might be grassini, it might be, you know, crisp bread. Um, but I think when we differentiate it from the commodity and get people to taste it and to recognize this is a unique experience that is worth paying for, that's when it's gonna happen. And I think a good a good place to start is with the is with the chefs with the restaurants. If you, can talk, if you can talk a chef, a local chef, uh, into possibly doing a tasting menu with bread pairings, you know, it, it might be a good place to start. But again, the idea is to elevate public perceptions, I think. And that's exactly how Glenn Roberts started Anson Mills, was with, start with the chefs and let it trickle down, and, and so many things start at the white tablecloth level and then trickle down to the mainstream. But that, and that's just, again, scratching the surface of trying to answer that.